that's got to hurt. This is a real bone-crunching attack. 34 moves leading to checkmate. Love it when super GMs just blow each other off the board. So Wesley So here, he's got the white pieces against Nihal Sarin. It's the finals of the chess.com global championships. Lot of money on the line. Day one, this is rapid chess and this is game one. Let's see what happened. So Wesley kicks off with e4. We had e5 from his Indian prodigy opponent Nihal Sarin. Now we had knight f3 and knight f6, the Petrov or Russian defence. Reputation for being rock solid. Can Wesley break it down? So he takes the classical way to play. His knight gets kicked back. This one chops on e4 and now he goes d4. By the way, knight c3, very common popular move at top levels. This kind of modern way to play, the players often castle queen side there, but this is the classical way to play here. But this is the twist. So after bishop d3, all down the years, you've seen the top moves being bishop e7, bishop d6, or knight c6. Lot of theory there. But lately, the players have been playing bishop to f5. Clearly, this variation's in favour right now. So similar ideas to maintain this knight on e4. Black wants to keep it there as long as possible. White's going to challenge it soon. First castles was played. Bishop e7, rook e1, castles from black, and now knight b to d2, all standard stuff. And now there's a question put to this knight, what do you want to do with it? If you capture on d2, this isn't good because white can take this bishop here. Say takes here, check, queen recaptures, best way to play. And white's just a little bit better because they've picked up the bishop pair here, small lead in development. And it's those kind of micro advantages that can lead to big advantages later in the game. So instead the move here is knight d6. You drop the knight back, it was pressured, it had to move, but you also cover the bishop here. But Wesley doesn't take. He wants to exchange that tension on his own terms. So first he carries on his manoeuvring, moves the knight, which then frees the bishop to develop. So c6 played, bolsters the centre. Long term, white's going to look to play for c4, so this makes a lot of sense. Bishop f4 develops. We had takes here on d3 now, because by the way, this development, it now attacks the knight, which is defending this bishop. So that's why the tension now gets exchanged. And now knight to a6 was played. Strange looking move. Knight d7 looks way more common there. But again, this is where the prep's quite deep at the elite level. Practice has shown that this knight actually sits really well on e6. Puts the question to this bishop. Puts some pressure on this pawn. Okay, long term deep ideas. Now we had knight e3. Looking to hop into this f5 square. Do you want to play g6? Well, maybe, but you weaken the dark squares. And they're always nervous to weaken squares, these super GM players. So knight c7, Nihal carries on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now we had pawn b3 from Wesley. He's preparing c4. Knight e6 came. The bishop came to e5. And this is a very interesting moment. Look at the clock situations. Pretty much neck and neck. Nihal's got a lot of time. Now look at his time. Six minutes burnt on this move of playing f6. What are the pros? Well, you take control of the e5 square from both the bishop and this knight. What are the cons? Well, you've just weakened e6 and g6, and this is why he hesitated. So the bishop drops back to g3, and now this next move looks quite weird. The knight comes back to c7. It's just come from that square, so why would you underdevelop it? Well, when you played f6, you weakened this square. That piece was loose, eyed by the rook. Now, you could have gone queen d7, but there's the second purpose of this knight now supporting d5. Because when Wesley goes c4, which he duly did on this move, now the knight's covering that pawn. You can carry on developing queen to d7. So the queen covers e6, connects the rooks. Now rook e2 from Wesley, preparing to double on the open file. This rook comes to challenge. This one doubles. The bishop drops back, opens the eyes of the rook. And now how would you play here? Well, the next move by Wesley is nice. Pawn to h4. Just starting the squeeze on the king side here. Once you started this weakening move, well, let's see if we can induce further weakening moves around that king. Now this rook centralized to the d file. Again, looking at ideas here, maybe one day taking on c4, getting pressure against d4. h5 from Wesley. Now queen f7 was played, and it looks like this pawn should just be dropping off the board. But Wesley goes a4. He ignores that. 
Why? Because actually you cannot take that pawn. If you jump in and munch it, can you see the move here for white to win the game on the spot? So the move to play is pawn to c5. The problem being wherever this knight moves to, let's say it comes to f7, then you drop this knight on c7. The queen on f7 was laterally defending that knight. That's why the queen is glued to this seventh rank defending the piece. So the pawn's immune, a4 just played. Now we had a6 from Nihal, not entirely clear what his intentions were. Okay, takes control of b5, stops a queen ever pivoting or something. Maybe he wanted b5 on a good day, just some kind of waiting move. And Wesley now goes knight to h4, very direct, carrying on with his plan. Still the pawn is immune for the same tactic. And now Nihal, he takes on c4 here, releases the tension, then goes knight e6, because if you go knight e6 straight away, well then you hang a pawn, this is the problem. Now the knight can take here. So instead we had this one taking. Pawn recaptures, now knight e6. He's looking for pressure here. And Wesley kicks on with pawn to c5. The knight stumbles back. And now here this pawn is attacked by the knight because this one is pinned to the queen. But what does Wesley do? Bang, knife f5 as they say. Once a knight lands on f5, Gary Kasparov used to say it was worth a pawn. He lets this one be captured using that pin, but Wesley just slides this queen across to f3. Just a brilliant attacking sense here from Wesley. Because after these rooks come off, queen recaptures. He even can give a second pawn, which Nihal takes. He didn't have so much better. By the way, look at the clock times. Nihal's down to 15 seconds. Then this queen g4 moves, uh, move comes. And there's just so many problems around the king here. So for starters, the threat here is to go knight h6 check, forking queen and king. So what happens if you sidestep? Most natural move on the board. Well, then there's knight g6. Uh, g6, well, that's an awkward uh, slip of the tongue. <laughs> knight g6. So really thematic stuff. You're checking that king. And if pawn captures, we have this one recapturing, hitting the queen, it slides away, let's say it's d5, and now you check. And this is the mating pattern, this is the problem. Once this pawn lands here, plus this bishop is hemming in the king, this is a problem. So there's these kind of themes in the air here. So this is why the queen sidestep to d7, now you're not get, uh, getting hit with this fork, and you also give the king some room in some lines to try and run away. But what does Wesley do? How does he carry on the attack? Well, he bangs down knight g6 anyway. Again, huge problems. Now, it was captured here, but if you try something different, let's say knight to d6, you ignore it, you put a question to this one, well, then again, there's this knight h6 check move. The whole attack is just really awesome. So if the king sidesteps, let, oh no, you can't sidestep, sorry, this one covers it. No, so in this line, you have to capture, and then there's knight e7, double check from queen and knight, this is the problem. The king has to come up. If it goes to the corner, it just gets mated like this. So if it comes to f7, you check, it goes, and again, you just discover the check like this. The queen has to block, and then you take and you mate like this. So there's just all of these problems for the black king. It's getting completely hunted. So this one was captured, pawn takes, but we've already seen the problems here. The knight came to e7, desperate defense. How does Wesley finish the game? If you want to pause and look for it, please do so. So very, very thematic. Like said, this knight's so powerful. Wesley wants to keep it. He smashes through with the rook. Now we see the queen recapture here. If you go with the bishop, well then there's queen h3. This is slightly more accurate than queen to h5 because you x-ray this diagonal. Now queen e6 would be played here. This is the best move, but then you can actually take here on e7 with check. If the queen recaptures, again you're getting mated because you're hemmed in by your own pieces. Whoops, not mean to highlight that one. And if instead of the queen capturing, say you go to f8, well, then we can actually take, again, you're just getting mated here. You just really can't stop that. If you come here, we check, king f8, and like this. No, whoops, that one's the best. So, okay, it's all just completely over. After rook takes on e7, we had queen captures here. Now this knight took, bishop takes back, 
and check this was the final move of the game. If the king sidesteps, you're getting mated. If it comes this way, again we slide back and it's leading to mate. King g8, check, king f8, and again the king is mated because it's blocked in by its own bishop here. So Wesley takes down Sarin in game one, they drew game two, game three again went to Wesley, very interesting exchange sack, and they drew game four. So Wesley's 3-1 up at the half time, they play four more tomorrow, Sarin needing to strike back. I hope you enjoyed this game, hit that thumbs up if you did, do consider subscribing to the channel and if you want to see part 2 of my amazing documentary series covering the chess cheating scandal then check out the video on screen now. Thanks very much for watching and I hope to see you soon.